Chicago, it's Startup Hype Man, the podcast. What's up, everyone? My name is Raj Nation, founder and chief pitch artist at Startup Hype Man, where we help startups not suck at how they pitch themselves. How? By making sure their audience sees them not as the best, but as the only. And this podcast is the only show where you will hear from leaders in the startup ecosystem sharing a piece of their heart, their mind, and their story on how they are charting their own path, growing their companies, and choosing not to play the game, but to change the game. Before we get going, hit the subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. Also, head over to StartupHypeMan.com and subscribe to our Point of View letter, where we share original articles, insights, and resources all to help you become the only of your industry. All right, get your popcorn ready and get hyped. It's showtime. Ladies and gentlemen, making his way to the microphone from upstate New York and Bangalore, India, and currently residing in San Francisco, California. He is the founder and CEO of Fermat Commerce, Please welcome Risha Jane. Hey, man, I don't, <laughs> I have to say, I really want every day when I walk into the office for that track to play. That's, this is like, what I'm going to do uh, is get this audio recording and then just have it play every <laughs> single time I walk into the office in the morning. <laughs> And then just hype up the entire office and then just switch out, you know, my name for other people's names as Perfect. they walk into the office every morning. Because <laughs> I am like 99% sure that if I did that, the amount of work that would get done is going to be like 5x more than what's currently getting done. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, the hype man, I got I to gotta do my job of hyping you up and we'll even do you one better, actually, uh, when the show, when the, when we're going to, we'll send you uh, the little sample video segment. Uh, so you not only will have the audio, you'll have the video as well of just your introduction. Oh shit. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's have our own cage match here. So again, he is Rishabh Jane, founder and CEO of Fermat Commerce. Fermat Commerce is the creator driven distributed commerce network, creating shopping experiences that engage your audience with the brands you love, where you make your content. <laughs> So they've got a nice dual-sided market situation going on here, which involves having a particular message to, to a particular audience on both sides. And it also has involved in Rishab's journey to this point, running pre-sales, which is why our topic today is generating pre-sales before launching your product. Once again, Rishab, welcome to the show. Why is this on your mind? Why is this important to you? Yeah. I mean, so I've always been the type of founder who's very market driven. I, I think there's like fundamentally two different types of founders, or at least the types of founders who I've met. There's like tech driven founders and there's market driven founders. And I'm squarely in the market driven founder category. And so for me, when I was starting this company, job number one was go out and talk to as many CMOs. I knew I wanted to build something in the marketing space. So go and talk to as many CMOs as possible. And then once I understood the problem space, I was like, okay, now the next thing for me to do is to actually like truly generate sales or truly generate people who are in the pipeline and are actively saying, hey, we are going to work with you the moment the product is released. So not just a passive signup form, but like actual pre-sales, right? So, so that's sort of why I think in that way, I think that there are, you know, you can build amazing companies being sort of a tech driven founder where it's like, okay, I don't have to even worry about the market because as long as I solve X, a market exists. So, you know, like a very stereotypical example is any sort of drug. It's like, okay, I know that as long as I produce a drug that does X, you know, people have X sort of symptom or X sort of disease. And so I don't even need to worry about the market side. I don't have to do any of that. I just need to produce the drug, right? But mm. for me, I'm like squarely a market-driven founder. And so that's why that that's sort of the topic that I think about a lot is how do you appropriately generate pre-sales in a way in which sets you up for success, right? Because you can also, I mean, it's very easy to mess up pre-sales, so. We're going to dive a whole lot more into that and Rishab's journey in 
generating these pre-sales, the lessons learned along the way. Before we do that, let's learn more about Rish of the person. Now, I mentioned in your introduction, you spent time growing up between upstate New York and Bangalore, India. Um, a little bit of duality situation going on there. Tell me, like, how do you think about how living in two different countries altogether growing up has shaped your perspective on people? Yeah. So when I was growing up, I was the only brown kid in this like small town in upstate New York, right? So I actually was born in upstate New York in this town called Syracuse. It's a college town. Mm -hmm. And go orange. <laughs> and so, and so while I was there in the, you know, mid eighties through mid nineties, I, I was the only brown kid. And so basically I learned at that time how to sort of like manage my personality, given that I was different from the other kids around me. And then it turns out that even going to India now I was the American kid, right? So even <laughs> though I'm like nominally Indian in origin by going to actual India, and having an American accent and not speaking the local language, I, I was the American kid. And so I think that what growing up in these two different countries taught me is that like being quote unquote different from other people can show up in ways in which you don't sort of expect, but it sort of teaches you how to interact with people and how to interact with yourself in those contexts. And then over time, it teaches you how to just embrace, okay, I understand this different view. I understand why this person has this different view. And so I think it taught me in general, just how to be curious about other people and how to actually listen to other people's perspectives and not assume just because they may look like they fit into a certain category that they're actually going to be the same as other people in that category. Right. Again, I was like the Indian kid in India, but I was like squarely different mm -hmm. because I was the one who was born in the U S right. I had a similar experience, not that I ever lived anywhere else um, outside of the US, but being the Indian kid here and then visiting relatives in India. And it was like, you know, it's like they can't understand my accent when I go there. They're like, you're talking too fast, slow down. Or I always joke about like when travel, it's like when you're in America, it's like you're Indian. But then when you travel to other countries, you're American, like you tell yeah. them you're American. And it's this, I think it's this interesting duality that presents itself. And clearly for both of us, what that meant was our, our beard games are on point at the end of the day. You know, it's the number one thing that I get a comment on. I was just catching up actually with an old friend from my previous workplace. Uh, he now leads like Corp Dev at a different company. But anyway, he, the, the moment I got onto camera, he was like, Risha, the one thing that has never changed about you is you get onto camera and your beard is perfectly groomed. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, hey, man, you got to do what you got to do, you know? <laughs> you got What you got to say in response to that is, like, in reference to your company, tech game good, beard game vicious. <laughs> I, I always say that whenever it's like, like if someone's like, uh, you know, oh, nice socks, I'll be like, whatever game good, sock game vicious. <laughs> <laughs> so beard game vicious is your new, your new uh, slogan there. Um, now, let's talk about your education. Um, you know, you've had experience at Wharton, you've had experience at Stanford, at MIT, um, and all the way up to a PhD. Do you just love being in school? Do you love the classroom setting? Um, why did you decide to go all the way to the PhD level? Yeah, I would say it's two things. Uh, I, I think that I'm a reasonably curious person. So Truly what ended up happening was in college, I just couldn't decide what I wanted to learn, right? And so I got degrees in in like in 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 finance from the Wharton School and then in physics and in material science on on the sort of engineering and college side. And then I actually worked in banking for a summer because people at Penn, the number one thing to do if you go to college at Penn is to go to consulting and banking, especially in like 07, 08, before the financial crisis. And so as, as that summer happened, I was like, okay, like, let's just see what all the hype is about. Let's go do a summer internship in banking. And then the second half of that summer, I was doing, I've, I was always doing research just because I love to understand how things work. Um, and then I just got so pulled into like the world of research and understanding how things work that I, I just couldn't help myself. And so I was like, I, I want to do a PhD. I want to live a life where I have done a PhD. And so I'm just going to go do it even though I knew I was never going to be an academic, right? So the PhD was actually the goal in and of itself. And then I was like, okay, and then I'll start, a, I'll start a company at some point later. I'll just go to a PhD, 
learn more about how to understand how the world works and then worry about starting a company after that. So that's, that's like truly what was going through my mind at that time. So I think it's safe to say then you are a recovering banker or recovering finance industry person. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, so I was sitting at Morgan Stanley in 2008 in the middle of the financial crisis. Ooh. I was, I was there that summer. Uh, and I saw like desks emptying out in front of me. I, I mean, recovering, I think is like a generous, is a generous word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, you know, some people they're in that industry and it's whether they like it or not, they end up becoming lifers in it. How did you make that successful transition away and then decide, you know, what was next and ultimately decide, hey, entrepreneurship is going to be the thing I'm going to not just think about, but pursue for real? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that the biggest draw to the finance industry is that it's pretty lucrative. So, and then there's a lot of marketing around how to get like to, to potential candidates to work in the finance industry around how it's, you know, very challenging and all these things, but I'll just, I'll just share something in candor that was said to me verbatim while I was there that summer, <laughs> I was told, Hey, Risha, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do this job. You just need to want it more than the next guy. And hmm. so those, when those words were said to me, I was like, I, I, I actually understand. And I actually think there's a lot of wisdom in those words. Like, I, I think that's true for a lot of things, but a lot of the sort of, you know, allure and grandeur of the finance industry sort of faded away a little bit when those words were said to me at that time. And so it was sort of easy for me, you know, 21 year old me to distance myself from the finance industry at that time. Right. Mm. And then I, and, and like I mentioned, I was always interested in, in company building. So actually the moment I started my PhD within a year or two, I had tried to start my first company. Right. And so I actually started two companies during my PhD before uh, going and working at a different company and then now starting this company. Mm. So, Okay. So Fermat is within the e-commerce space. You talked about being more obsessed with you know, markets than you are obsessed with technology, you know, necessarily. How do you decide and land on, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to build a company in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's exactly, that's exactly a great question. So, I mean, basically what ended up happening was in 2020, 2021, that was roughly the time when I was deciding to leave my prior job and sort of leave to start a company. And it was very hard to ignore what was happening in e-commerce in mm. 2020 and 2021, right? So because of the pandemic, you know, supposedly five years worth of growth of e-commerce got pulled forward. You saw all of these trends around content creators and influencers driving way more commerce than ever before growing. I mean, every sort of growth rate expectation was beat multiple times over essentially. And so that was like the first indicator that, okay, there's something happening here that if I don't participate in, I'm just going to watch it happen and I will have never participated. The second really big thing was we were at a company called LiveRamp. It's this obscure company that sits in the middle of the ad tech ecosystem. But the reason I say that is as Apple was making its changes to the privacy ecosystem, we sort of saw, okay, the entire world of e-commerce and ad tech is about to change, right? And now there's all these stories around, oh my gosh, this D2C e-commerce company, like the stock price has plummeted because of Apple's privacy change, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing all those stories emerge and it's, it's because of how the fabric of that ecosystem is changing. And we saw that coming. So on the one hand, we saw this massive trend. On the other hand, we saw this change and it was like, okay, the market is, is there. We just need to go build something to solve this problem. Now, that said, I gave a very brief introduction of your company. I talked about create. It's the creator-driven distributed commerce network to create shopping experiences that engage your audience with the brands you love, where you make your content. Can you expand on that a little bit more and give our listeners an idea of what exactly is the offer here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the really simple idea is today when you are watching something let's say on TikTok or on Instagram from like an influencer that you follow. And they say, Hey, here's like 
uh, this shirt that I bought from whatever company, right? From Cuts or whatever. Let's just use mm-hmm. that as an example. Then today, the way that you actually go and buy that shirt, if you're just like, man, that looks good on him. It'll look good on me too. I want to just buy that. The way you do that is they'll like say, hey, here's the code. Link in bio. <laughs> or you go to the link in bio, you like go to one step and then you go to another page. Now you're yeah. on the Cuts website. The Cuts website has nothing to do with the content that you were watching, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like, it's just their B2C website, which is, which is fine, but it has nothing to do with where you came from. And so, and then now you have to remember to go put that code in, in order to make sure that the influencer you followed gets the attribution. And so it's, it's, I mean, and even then this system works, which is like crazy to me. <laughs> like when you walk through the steps, the, the thing that's crazy is not like you would think like, oh, and this does not work. The thing that's crazy is like, this sort of works, yeah. right? Which, which means there's so much intent to purchase at the Yeah, you're willing to jump through so many, have so much friction in the process. Yeah. Yeah. It's like unbelievable. And so it's like, okay, why don't, why don't we just kind of make this simpler? And wherever you see the content, if you click one button, you get taken into a checkout experience that actually is a combination of the brand and the creator. So instead of your standard product images, you now have the creator walking you through like a very fast checkout process. And, and then you're, and then you actually are done. Right. And then you go back to the content once you're done. So you close out and you're done. Right. And so the whole idea is, is really twofold and why, why we say like creator driven distributed commerce. So the creator driven part is as you do the checkout, we personalize it to the creator by using their images, their text, their voice, their video. And then the second part is it's distributed, meaning you don't have to, you know, click multiple places. Mm. You just, you just check out at the point at which you learn about the product. So that's, that's like really what we do. So we're cutting out multiple steps, making it easier to buy. And then on top of that, I imagine um, the, brand who's selling the product in the first place has a little bit more ownership of the process, maybe even a little bit more ownership of, or, or to, to your point before about like Apple and big tech, right? They're less beholden to like the random, <laughs> random September announcement of, Hey, we're changing everything. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So like the one liner that you say to a creator is like, Hey, keep your audience engaged while they are doing commerce. Right. So mm. Like in today's world, you like bounce them out. They go to the other website. So the one liner to the, to the creator is like, keep your audience engaged and allow them to do commerce. Really mm-hmm. simple. The one liner to the brand is capture the consumer where they have the intent to buy. It's really simple, right? It's just like, don't let's like not create all of these crazy journeys. Let's just do the thing that we actually want to do. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now that said... Let's, I think that's a great on-ramp to our topic today, which is generating pre-sales before launching your product. Now, you talked about those one-liners, which I think are great. I'm curious to know, at least to start here, this idea of let's generate pre-sales, was that by design or was that by circumstance? Like, What went into the decision-making here? Oh, 100% by design. 100% by design. So basically, like as a market-driven founder... The number one thing I believe is you don't want to build something unless there is somebody telling you that like with pretty high conviction that, Hey, if you build X, it will help us with, you know, whatever problem we have. Right. And so the way we generate pre-sales is it's like, not really like the Robin hood style. So like Robin hood was like a zero, you know, zero fee trading app. Right. And then you like, I don't know if you remember, but like whatever, five, seven years ago, you signed up for a form and then you just like hung out for yeah, 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 months and months and months. Yeah. And so like, actually it turns out that if you do that, the drop-off rate is like 80% from, from sort of like, just like getting a form fill from people and then, and then doing nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, so that's like not a good idea in, in my, well, I mean, it depends on your point of view. I, sure. I think that that doesn't help with the kind of product strategy that I am describing, right? It helps with a certain type of thing, which is like, hey, look at uh, look at how many random people will like say yes to yeah. this simple Have message. expressed interest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, whereas what we wanted to do is we wanted to actually 
build a product sort of with high, high level of input. And so what we did is we said, hey, here's the problem we can solve, right? So let's just say we go to the creator side. Hey, we can keep your audience engaged on your content while you drive commerce. So today when your audience clicks on an affiliate link, they bounce out, you have no idea what happens. How does that sound? And would you be interested in working with us if we made it happen in two months, right? And so now what happens is actually there's a reason they know upfront, hey, here's how long it's going to take. And then more importantly, what you do is you then say, and why don't we show you as we are building it, what it's going to look like? <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so this is super important because it keeps them engaged throughout that process. And you don't have that massive 80% drop off when you actually go live. Instead, what happens is you have a mechanism with which you can actually get ongoing input into your design process where somebody says like, oh, it would be great if I could like customize the color of the font, or it would be nice if I could put my image in here, or it would be nice if I could do X or Y. And you really understand exactly what they are thinking with respect to how it can really pop in their content. And then we did the same thing on the brand side. So we said, hey, we can actually, whatever is the work you're doing with your creators, we can actually make that into a sales channel for you, right? Mm. And if we could do that, in two months, would you work with us in X, Y, Z way, right? And then if they said yes, you say, awesome. What are the things that you would need? So what would happen if we did A, if we did B, if we did C, and again, engage them throughout the process and then just keep them updated every like two to four weeks, basically, Mm -hmm. on the actual product development process and get input. And so what was happening is we were getting hard commits. And then we were also, as the product was getting ready, we would actually literally start onboarding them uh, as the product was getting ready. So the product was not fully ready, but we would onboard them already and then start the other steps prior to a launch, right? And so that's sort of how we think about pre-sales is it's actually a product building process. It's not just a sort of, hey, here, look at the interest that I have. What I really like about this approach is it hedges against crickets when you do actually launch, which I I, I don't just think, I know because I've seen so, it happens to so many companies, so many founders, they build in secret for so long. Um, I have to believe a lot of it is actually ego getting in the way because they don't want to be told what you're building may not work because I don't know, they've already put in uh, 20, 40 hours, maybe more than that, like just thinking it and like, oh, it's going to be amazing. And so they almost like shoot themselves in the foot in the process. And I even know like, so from past experience myself um, with previous stuff, uh, previous companies, like in creating information products, one of the things I used to do was like, um, I'd see if people want, I, I, uh, so like last company, my co-founder and I built an online course. We didn't build it until we had confirmed people want it. We said, Hey, here's like a rough idea of what's going to be in it. Would you want this? And they were like, yeah. And then I'd, and then I was like, okay, to be a part of a test run, how much would you be, how much would you be willing to pay to be part of the test run for it? And, you know, they were like 85 bucks. And I was like, okay, great. Well, you pay me $60 or 65 today to lock your spot in. And they'd be like, oh yeah, sure. So like we'd actually even get money and revenue in upfront to kind of like fund in a way, and it was a small amount, but fund the development of it just to prove people are willing to put money down today for this. And the trick we would do was not the trick, but the technique was whatever, whatever dollar amount we, they said, we would go a little bit underneath that. And that's where you also prove if someone's legit or not, right? That's, that was our marker was, are they, are they for real? Cause if they're like, Oh yeah, I would totally do this. Let me know when it's ready. Cause yeah. a lot of people say that, right. Oh, yeah. You're like, okay, oh, great. Yeah. Venmo me right now. And they'll, you know, the, a much smaller percentage will do that, but that's how you know who to build for. Exactly, exactly. So we actually did a very similar thing, which was at the, so the way we built our product, if you're a Shopify brand, you basically download a Shopify app. And the moment you do that, you actually accept the billing terms. Okay, mm. so before anything was ready, they accepted the billing terms. And so it was exactly the same idea, which is, hey, huh. Like not only are you saying, hey, you're going to join this, this product, you're actually downloading sort of like the V0.0 of it, meaning it's not ready, but you are committing to like giving us access to your e-commerce surface. 
and you are agreeing to billing terms. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. so now when it finally launches, it's like, okay, we have like pretty high conviction that if this person took the trouble to download it, got whatever approvals they needed to internally to do that, and actually gave us billing rights at the point of download, it's like, okay, now it's pretty clear, right? Mm-hmm. That, that they have actually bought the thing, even though it doesn't function. So in this approach, you know, you'll often hear people say, and you know, with I think at least semi good reason, like, oh, you should do like surveys, you know, you should do a little bit of like focus groups to understand what your market wants. Are you saying do this instead or do this after you have some initial idea? Oh, I might see, I might be in like the overkill category, but I did all of the discuss. So I I even split up the discovery into two parts. So hmm. I had three stages before we ever launched a product. Okay. So, so stage one was problem discovery only. So I do this model where I intentionally do not talk about the solution at all in a first phone call. I just sit there and talk about like, Hey, have you heard about X? Like X being some sort of form of problem or help me understand how you, I mean, for our case, what we did literally was hey, how much of your marketing budget today is is split into performance versus brand marketing? Okay, like we just started at the highest level and then we drilled down from there and then just really understood what was the problems in like the sort of the biggest areas that somebody is thinking about if they're a CMO, right? So that's what we did in phase one. Phase two was solution discovery. Hey, we talked about this last time. If we were able to solve your problem with, you know, Proposal B, proposal F, proposal, you know, W, how do these ones sound? Right. And then they're just like, ah, this one is like super annoying because like, you know, the other side has all the power and this and that. Right. And it's like, or "Ah, I tried that before and it doesn't really work, whatever. And then, and then they would just like actually, and then in the solution call, I would say like, Hey, great. What if I told you, like, we're ready for it. Would you download it now? Like, what would be the steps at your, at your company to, to like actually hit go? Right. So in solution discovery, you can't say is how does this sound? That that never works. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say, like, let's go, right? Like, t- like we are hitting go. What happens next? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, actually my CTO is gonna be like <laughs> on my case because it's like, do we actually like what is the engineering resource to use your product and this and that? And like all of a sudden all the objections show up. So then that's solution discovery. And then you do the pre-sales. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So stage three in that, so stage one, problem discovery, where you don't mention the solution at all. Stage two is solution discovery, where, you know, hey, if we could solve it, solve that problem with this, you know, essentially, what are your considerations? And then once there's, you know, once you get enough intent or interest in there, you're like, all right, here's what's next. Let's go. We're doing this. You don't say, how would, how does that sound? Stage three then is the pre-sale itself. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. That's the hard commit. That's when they're downloading or like nominally downloading something or like saying, okay, yeah, let's hit go. And you start the motions, even though you're only going to be actually ready two months from now. Are you doing that stage three pre-sale on the same call as the solution discovery? Or are you like, let's talk again in one week where I'll have this information for you? Uh, I do it in the, I do it in a follow-up. So okay. So basically, yeah, each one of these stages is a separate call. Just sometimes stage two and three can't like will happen on the same call, depending on like how excited the customer is. Mm-hmm. But the intent a priori is have three calls because basically you really want to make sure that the person is actually committed. Okay. So you didn't. So this is interesting. All right. So I want to unpack this a little bit more. I would think. You'd want to capture their excitement in the moment and and get them to sign, quote unquote, right then and there. You're saying, yeah, you know, sometimes maybe that happens, but you actually want to intentionally create a little bit of a gap to see if the initial uh, excitement they're feeling is going to taper or if it sustains. Exactly, because you're not going to sell them the product, right? You're going to sell them that they're going to get the product in two months. <laughs> so, uh. so, so like what you don't want to do is get somebody so excited that they like want it right now because you can't fulfill it because it doesn't exist yet. Right. Mm. Um, so actually like having these three stages is helpful because it is more likely that that person 
is like a patient excited customer as opposed to an excited impatient customer. Say that last part again. So by having these three stages, it is more likely that you end up with an excited and patient customer as opposed to an excited and impatient customer. All right. I want everyone listening to write that down right now. There is a difference between an excited and impatient customer and an excited and patient customer. Excited and patient is actually what you want to go for because it gives you the opportunity to get your stuff put together without, you know, essentially pissing them off, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And on average, those are the people who are actually going to co-build with you, right? Mm. So again, because the way that, again, the type of founder that I am at least, and I'm sure some segment of your listeners are, is like very being very market-driven means that input during the product build phase is super useful. Hmm. Now, how do you decide, and, and I want to confirm, I want to make sure I understand this correctly, in that pre-sale then, I mean, where the word sale is involved. So you are getting some money down or is it a commitment? Is it like a letter of intent? What is there an actual like transaction that's occurring at that point? Yeah. So they are actually signing. If So one of two things, either if it's like an app, they are actually agreeing to the terms and conditions and to the billing, uh, to the billing mechanism that you mm-hmm. have in place. So again, for us as a Shopify app, we get them to agree to our terms and conditions and we get, get billing access rights. So like from the get-go, we are actually able, it is, it is a contractual agreement where we have billing rights to pull billing as soon as the product is turned on. And then, so, so sort of the parallel, if you don't have that type of mechanism is you actually have a signed contract with billing terms in that contract that start charging the customer the moment the product is turned on. Hmm. Okay. So, so unlike the, on either side, whether it's the creator or the brand side, are you like in your problem discovery? Did you, or I guess your solution discovery, your phase two or stage two, is that where you're tossing out like how much would you pay for this and figuring out what that final number is going to be? Actually, the way that we did it is we're in a space where there's enough other benchmarks. So we, we kind of knew the number to ask for. Mm. And so we actually just asked for different numbers <laughs> to different yeah. customers. So we said like, hey, like, let's just say, I- I'm just going to make something up, but let's just say it's like, hey, how does two sound? Great. How does five sound? Great. How does eight sound? Great. How does 10 sound? Great. And and we knew that the range was like one to 10 and not mm-hmm. 10 to a hundred, right? Right. So, because it's like a, it's like yeah, a you're, in, you're, in, you're in the, the realm or the ballpark, right? Based exactly. on the industry benchmarks. But then you hit a point where they're like, no, that's too much, right? Exactly. 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 Or I would need to get approval, right? Like basically if you hear, I would need to get approval or, (laughs) or, or like, Hey, this is like, this sounds like a lot. Like why would, you know, what are we getting in return? Mm -hmm. And you've already talked about the value that you're getting in return. Then you'd sort of know, okay, now I've ever shot. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like this. this, I like where this conversation is going a lot and you know, we, we talked about how this all leads into the idea of the co-build and like developing alongside them. And I want to use that as a moment to connect with our listeners here, because maybe you don't have the ability in-house to develop that big app or that big uh, software idea that you've got. Because the reality is, you know, creating an app is not easy, A. And even if you do think it is easy, or maybe you've got that access, making users stick to it is Definitely not easy, and it's incredibly harder. About four and five apps launched in app stores, if you didn't know this, get deleted after a single use. I know if I were to look at my phone right now, which I actually am, um, there are like probably more than half of what's on my phone has the little cloud logo next to it, meaning it went back up into the cloud. And probably a lot of them on there I should be deleting, but I just <laughs> I, I put them on like page nine, so I never look at them, anyways. So that's the reality, right? So how do you thrive if you don't have a profound app development and UX experience? Well, you don't have to be doomed to failure. There's a team that can help you out in validating your concept, designing, 
developing and launching launching your app. A lot of the stuff that Rishabh has been talking about that he's experienced in his own journey. And that partner that's available to you, their name is Mikito. They are the experienced experts that have built over 150 successful products for both startups and enterprises. And what that means is they know the stickiness and the scale at the enterprise level, but they have the agility and the speed to work at the startup level. Yours could be next in a line of successful apps, over 150 that they've created so far. What do you need to do? Talk to Mikito. Maybe join forces with them. At least see what they're all about. And you can learn more at Mikito.com slash hype man. M-I-Q-U-I-D-O.com slash hype man. Mikito.com slash hype man. Today on Startup Hype Man, the podcast, we are with Rishabh Jain, the founder and CEO of Fermat Commerce. And our topic is generating pre-sales before launching your product. Now, Rishabh, before the break there, we talked about this idea of like the co-build or the co-development with them. I want to know, and I want to go through that process with you. But first, my question is, to, at least as best as you can recall, how do you like? I guess sell in the idea to them that hey, we're gonna like build this alongside, and you're you're gonna provide input along the way, like like literally down to like what words do you use to pitch that to them? Yeah, I mean, so the very first thing is just setting the expectation really clearly that the app will be ready on X date in the future, right? So when we were doing this in you know December January, what we told people is hey, the app will be ready in April, right? And so, and along the way, we would love your input into exactly what are, as we are building the features, how that actually helps you solve X problem, right? So on the creator side, it's like, hey, we want it to be engaging in your content, right? So the, 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 the promise is keep the audience engaged while enabling them to do commerce. So, hey, make sure it's actually engaging. And so we would like show them a mock and say, hey, what do you think needs to change about this? How does this look? And then we would get input. We would keep it free form intentionally. So that way people could give different types of input. So on the creator side, it would be things like, hey, can I get the colors to match my website? Or, hey, can I get the font to look like X or Y, right? So they actually had specific ideas in mind for what it would make it look like or what would make it pop in their content. Hmm. On the brand side, it had more to do with okay, how do I actually manage my commission payouts? How do I actually manage the the way in which the order gets fulfilled? How do I make sure it's clear to the consumer as they are placing the order, right? So those were the types of questions that came up as we were showing them either stages of build or mocks, right? And we, we wouldn't overdo it. So we wouldn't go to the same brand over and over again as we would phase through this process, but we would just try to keep them engaged, right? Saying like, hey, as we said, this thing's going to be ready in April. We were curious if you had input. This is how it's looking right, like right now. And people people were happy to provide that input because we set the expectation up front that it's going to be April and that we would love their input as we were developing it. And so it felt like we were really building it for them, right? Mm. Now, if, and then we would intentionally have different people give us input at different stages. So that way we weren't like custom, we, you know, we didn't want to be a service shop in our case. And so... We wanted to, we are a product company. And so we would intentionally go to different people at different stages and sort of see, okay, are we actually building a universally usable product in this case? Right. And so that's, that's, that's like literally specifically how we did it. Okay. Now in that hypothetical timeline, you just threw out, you're like, Hey, it's January or maybe it was real, but it was, it was no, no, like, this is literally okay. what happened. Yeah, yeah. So you have January, um, and then you're like, Hey, it's going to be ready in April. When you say April, did you... In like, do you know in mind, like, hey, I'm giving ourselves a little bit of buffer time, or did you not account for that and needed more time? Yeah. So internally, we said it was March. And so I gave a little bit of buffer, but I don't, I'm not sure that a lot of buffer is a good idea. So, mm. so I, I actually, I mean, and maybe, you know, there's going to be technical founders on listening to this podcast who are going to be upset about this, but. <laughs> I, I think that you gotta you gotta plant a flag in the ground and then just say this is what it is, right? Mm. So, and I, and and you take input before you plant that flag in the ground, right? So it's not like you just make up a number um, yeah. or make up a date. But yeah, we definitely were not totally sure that we were going to hit it on that day. 
So I guess this then leads into this idea of like, you know, you're, you're, you're upfront, you're pre-selling a dream, you're selling a vision, and then you've got to make sure you don't disappoint both in hitting that timeline, but also in the, what the product becomes itself. What's the line between getting too much input versus not enough input, and then it doesn't meet expectations? Yeah. So I think this is where, I mean, we were pretty upfront with people. So I'm, I'm like very unafraid to say, Hey, we're a startup and we're going to continuously improve. So even in the April launch or, you know, sort of that alpha launch, we made sure that expectations were set that this thing is going to like change every two to four weeks. Right. And actually it did change every two to four weeks. Right. And now we're, we're recording this in mid June and, I mean, we've had like four major product releases in that time frame, mm. right? So people like to see velocity, actually. So it turns out that intercept is like one thing and people are like, okay, fine. I see this like at this point in time, but when they see the velo- when they see velocity, it like really helps a lot. And as a startup, I'm sure this is like overstated. Sure. Um, every dimension but as a startup velocity is the only thing you have right you like you actually do not have anything else and Mm so you might as well use that to your advantage right and and just show that to your customers and so like look at the end of the day did some customers say hey this is like not what we expected at the point at which we launched yeah some of them did right because some of them for whatever variety of reasons but we did it in a way in which we made sure that 80 percent of them were excited about what was happening. Right. And that's sort of like, that's, I think the right zone to be in is you want to launch such that if you make everybody happy at launch, now you've spent way too much time. And so it's like, yes, you want to do right by everybody. And you want to make sure that the large majority of your customer base is excited about what's happening. Now. And I think the other part of this too, is you can't launch with so much that it becomes hard to use from the start. Right. I think that's where like the idea of progressive rollout of additional features, like let someone get familiar with something first. And then once they've got that base behavior figured out and proven, then you start to layer in the additional functionality. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and in fact, (laughs) in our case, our first version, I, I would say was like in the zone of embarrassing. You know, it's like, it's, it's like this, it's like proto, you know, the prototypical, like if it's not embarrassing, you've launched too late. It was, it was definitely in the zone of embarrassing, but the key is like, you gotta, you gotta have high velocity. Right. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's right. You just, you just gotta show, you just gotta go feature after feature after feature. So for example, our very first version, it was a single, you could only put a single product into the shopping experience. Right. So like, of course, the number one thing that brand said was like, Hey, what if somebody, we want people to buy more than one product, right? We need the, we need the AOV to go up. And so, I mean, this is like an obvious thing. And we just made sure that that was true six weeks later, right? Mm. And it's just like, you show that you can like improve super fast and it's, and it feels, and it's true. And it feels like, Hey, we're listening to what you're saying, right? Well, and in that respect too, are you then also almost aside from, you know, progressive functionality, are you in any way holding back certain features to see like, do they really act like, I know they said, but like when it, when, when it comes down to it, is it something that they really want and are going to make use of? Is that, is that in your mind at all? I mean, I think that, that, that definitely helps. Right. But uh, it's like, it's definitely the case that there are certain things where, you know, like being able to check out multiple products, it's like reasonably clear that that is actually something that they want. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's like, I don't need to, I don't need to worry about whether or not this is actually, you know, something that they care deeply about. Um, in some cases, it is helpful to like hear it over and over again to really make sure that this is a high priority need in this sort of workflow. But I think that the thing that, the thing that matters the most is when somebody says it, do they feel like they're being heard mm. in, in your actions? Not just like, I hear you, I, not, not just sort of like, uh, you know, cajoling somebody, but like in your actions, do, do you demonstrate that you're listening to their input? I, I think that that's actually the most important part. Yeah. 
Now, in that process, whether it is the initial build or the progressive rollout of features after that, um, I, I don't know if you're aware, but there's that experiment around decision fatigue and choice theory with the jam jars, where it was like the grocery store experiment. They had this table of like 10 or 20 jams a person could sample. And then separately, they had a table you know, in a different grocery store where there was only two jams they could sample. I'm fudging the description a little bit. Fudge jams, probably poor choice of words there. Um, but what they found was that like people at the twenty, at the ten or twenty jam table, they were tasting a lot, but no one was buying because it was just overwhelming with so many options available to them. Whereas the table that had you know two or three options, their sales were much higher because it was easy to make a choice out of having only a few options in front of you. As you're starting to absorb feature requests and taking input in the co-building and then the progressive updates from there, are you worried at all about like, hey, we're packing too much into this, even though they say they want this thing, it's going to be like overwhelming now. And then and then the whole app becomes a poor experience. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess there's two dimensions to this. So the first one is that, as I briefly mentioned earlier, we actually don't go to the same brand over and over again over the course of that time span, right? So we intentionally go to different people over time because you're right, like you can't actually go to somebody over and over again. You want to go to them once or twice between, at least for us, between that January and April timeframe, right? So that way mm. it's like, hey, we're still here. We're listening to you. We're seeking your input. You have a quick interaction, let's say in like February, March, and then you know, you're ready to go in April, right? Mm. And so that's that's one side of this this sort of fatigue issue. The other side of it is, hey, have you like jammed too much into the actual product, right? And on that dimension, actually, we're actually only seeking input from people. We're not taking feature requests and saying like, hey, we will like have that feature. Because like, unfortunately, it is actually true that when when people say, hey, I want like X button really they're just trying to solve a particular problem, right? And so like we actually just take all of that input and then just say, okay, what is the problem that they're trying to solve? Right. And then we just, we release something that is actually quite simple, in fact. So we actually do the inverse where we release something that is simple and not overloaded with features. And, you know, for example, our very first release was like, hey, you can only put a single product in here. Let's just see, you know, it solves the, it solves your problem in terms of, you can actually check out directly in content. And so let's just see if this way of doing it will work and we'll like sort of see what the results are together, right? And so we actually try to keep it as simple as possible given the input that we have gotten instead of saying, instead of asking them like, hey, what features do you want? Now, once that goes live, then they will like really come at you with feature requests. <laughs> so yeah. there will be no, there will be no lack of, of, of requests. Yeah. Now that anecdote right there, that idea of taking into account, not, not what are they saying, but what, like, why are they saying it? What are they actually trying to accomplish with that request? Because they may not know the best way to figure out their problem. They're just like, oh, I need a button for X, but it might not be that they need a button. They just need to either be educated differently or have a different user flow, whatever that might be. This is a major reason why I stand high on the pedestal, high on the soapbox that product market fit is actually a misnomer and you should be seeking problem market fit, therefore creating product market pull. If you go for product market fit, you very easily can build the wrong product or, or scale the wrong product um, or do it do so for the wrong market. But if you get problem market fit, then you can then you you create the on-ramp to product market pull. First of all, I love that framing, but I love it. I I'm I think particularly because it puts you in the right mindset, which is mm -hmm. you should fall in love with a problem, not with a product. Right. As a founder, right? And so if as a founder you chase problem market fit and you fall in love with a problem, it allows you to be pretty, you know, unemotional about the product you build. Whereas if you seek product market fit, you know the temptation to push your product mm. to fit the market gets very high, right? I mean, and, and, it's, and it's for like good reason, right? Because it's, I mean, first of all, it's the, the only problem that actually matters as a, as a founder, because uh, if you don't have product market fit, then, you know, it's, it's doomed anyway. But mm -hmm. the, 
I, th- I think that it creates a lot of pressure by, yeah. by saying that word and it creates pressure that causes behavior that's actually ineffective. So I, I really love this idea of, of saying, Hey, Chase pro- problem market fit. And then products will just occur as a consequence. Of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Yeah. They occur as a consequence of that. This is also why I'm like, I really feel like as a company scales, the, the title should not be product marketer. It should be problem marketer. And then, because if you can just keep marketing to the problem, then you'll figure out what does what are the product updates need to be made. And unfortunately, I think a lot of product marketers end up just yeah, that's right. They creating sell so much material around like we have this new feature now. Go use it. You know, <laughs> man, that is yeah. Words, I mean, words matter a lot, and I, this is a really good this is a really good example of that. So. Let's go ahead and transition into our wrap. I, I honestly, I could, I could keep talking about this for another hour, but in the interest of everyone's time and schedule, we'll start our wrap up here. First off, Rishabh, where can our listeners find you? Where can they learn more about you? And where can they learn more about Fermat? Yeah. So uh, you could email me. I'm Rishabh at fermatcommerce.com. Our website is just fermatcommerce.com. So that's the easiest way to find me. Great. Now, Rishabh, who is one person you want to give a shout out to who you feel has been helpful on your journey? Yeah. So actually the one guy who has been pretty instrumental, he's a friend of mine from high school. He happens to be a founder in New York. His name is Arjun Narayan. He started a company called Materialize, totally different type of company. But I think that it's both conversations with him and direct help from him that allowed us to sort of get to where we are as a company today. We'll now do our top one or two lessons or takeaways for the listeners based on the discussion today. I'll go first, then I'll toss it over to you. The topic today was generating pre-sales before launching your product. There was so much good stuff in this. I have a whole like page full of notes from this conversation. Um, in the interest of not reading off the entire page of notes, uh, I think the one thing I want to hone in on here as a final takeaway is what you said about create customers who are excited and patient as opposed to excited and impatient. Risha, your top one or two lessons or takeaways for the listeners. Yeah. I think that in the conversation with you, I think one of the things that I had underappreciated that now I, I sort of like realize is actually pretty interesting is like the three phases that we used for discovery and pre-sales. So I think it was really the conversation with you that, I mean, I'd always had these first two phases of discovery and then the pre-sale, but I had never put it together as a pipeline until I was talking to you. And so I was like, oh, that's actually a really useful framework for me to tell other founder friends that (laughs) you should do this three-phase process and you can do it pretty quickly. You know, you could probably do it in the course of three months. So yeah, that was one of the things that I, I'm walking away with this conversation, realizing like, hey, this is this is actually probably a pretty good process. And just a reminder for the listeners, those three phases are problem discovery. That's phase one. Phase two is solution discovery. Phase three is pre-sale. Exactly. My final question, which is how we end every episode on this show. Rishabh, fill in the blank. Entrepreneurship is blank. Yeah. For me, entrepreneurship is making your dreams a reality. Say what? Why do you say that? I think that every entrepreneur, if they aren't doing it because there is a way that they believe the world should work and it just doesn't work that way today, it is not only do you not have the right drive in the morning, but it is hard to stay motivated in the tough times. And like, I, I literally wake up every day and I, whenever I see an experience that is like not a direct experience, I'm like, this is not the way the world should work. It, it, I, I really feel that way. And so I really feel that entrepreneurship is, is a journey of making your dreams a reality. Entrepreneurship is making your dreams a reality. He is Rishabh Jain with Fermat Commerce. Rishabh, thank you so much for joining today on Startup Hype Man, the podcast. Thanks. It was awesome being here. And listeners, stay in touch because coming soon later in 2022, we are dropping the official Startup Mixtape, a hip-hop album dedicated to the founder's journey. It'll be available on Spotify and all streaming platforms. Still working on the official name. 
but you can stay in tune and in touch with the upcoming uh, singles, tracks, and and uh, release dates simply by subscribing at startuphypeman.com. We'll see you next time. That's a wrap on this one. Shout out to our guests once again for sharing their story with us. If what you heard impacted you, do one of three things. One, let our guests know. Reach out to them directly. They love hearing from you. Two, leave a rating and review on Apple. Or three, simply hit the share button and share this episode with one friend who you think would benefit from hearing it. Catch our full episode archive at startuphypeman.com slash podcast. And if you want to make your pitch not suck, reach out to us through the website. That's all for this week. We'll catch you next time. Raj Nation out. Believe the hype.